Bonjour à tous. So, good morning to one and all. Thanks very much, uh, Jean Guillaume. Thanks very much, Jean Dominique uh, Senard, for having accepted to contribute to this event and to shed light um, on certain matters. Thanks to your thinking and your experience, you are a major CEO. Everybody knows who you are. You are CEO of Nissan and formerly of Michelin. And in your professional life, you're in the vanguard of uh, what's going on in the world. It's changing faces. But um, your qualities are such that you have critical insight. You go over and beyond the borders of the company that you work for to think about trend, economic trends and capitalism. We'll be talking about capitalism in just a moment. And also the major powers geopolitically. And some of your thoughts have been published in the opinion pages in Le Figaro, and I was delighted to see that. And I remember, in fact, a, a discussion you had with Mr. Le, de Fromontin on um, the way that you, as a CEO, you wanted to renew political life in France, to infuse in it more credibility and substance. So your views will be very precious, very rich. You have complex thought, and you, f you point to very uh, deep concerns. I think you all know uh, what Stendhal said, he was asked, what is beauty? He said, a promise of happiness. Uh, now, when you ask 30 years about what democracy is and what capitalism is, you might say a promise of, of uh, happiness. Fukuyama wrote a book, didn't he, saying that it was the end of history uh, with the, the gentle prosperity of trade and the uh, rule of law. And a certain number of Western countries signed up to that believed in that prospect. They thought it was self-evident. But of course, that self-evidence has disappeared. And this leads me to my first question. Could you remind us why it was a self-evidence in those days that liberal democracy and capitalism went hand in hand? And then perhaps we'll see why it's no longer the case. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good morning to one and all. Thank you very much for your welcome. It was very, very kind and warm. You, you were saying it was a complex matter, and I confirm that point. It is indeed extremely complex, and as a CEO, I, mean, I don't know whether I'm most competent to talk about this, but at least I can share with you my convictions this morning. In fact, this uh, relationship between capitalism and democracy uh, is a bit like the relationship in a, an old couple that has a roller coaster a ride in their married life. It's a long history, and I think that over the last few years, there has been different schools of thought about democracy and capitalism can or, or not uh, live, in, live together. One school in particular uh, refers to the fact that at the end of the day, capitalism will end up by destroying democracy because uh, the slippages of uh, capitalism are inevitable and will wipe democracy off the map. It's a robust school of thought, and there are arguments that can be deployed to support that thesis. But I think it's a bit strange when you think about it, because when you think about it in the long term, to be honest with you, capitalism has, generally speaking, brought a huge amount of well-being. I'm talking about the long term, yeah? Because, you know, without dwelling on statistics and what have you, you know, when you think about it, um, despite all the wealth that's generated in the world uh, and the amount of well-being, the middle classes in the world have grown. And st studies at the OECD and what have you said that 2009, 25% of the world population were in the middle classes. And in 2030, it should be around 50% possibly even more, which is rather impressive statistic. And we could also say that, after all, uh, we live longer. I mean, um, you know, it's increased uh, 20 years over the last 60 years. And this is a signal, I think, that global ca capitalism hasn't been a disaster everywhere. I, mean, I don't want to dwell on this, but um, access to education, access to health, despite the pandemic, but you know, after all, generally speaking, you know, things have made considerable progress, access to drinking water and what have you. But it's true, and there is a but, that for the last, what, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, possibly, uh, 
questions are being, searching questions are being asked about this relationship, this linkage between capitalism and democracy. Now, I was saying earlier on that those people think that capitalism could be extremely nefarious. Um, have, you know, they're right in part to say so. You said 30 years, but often I refer to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89. In those days, let's remember, at the end of the day, capitalism was triumphant, wasn't it? And people said in those days, look, history is over now. The discussion is over. Now we just have to carry on as is. And then very quickly, uh, we were disillusioned, weren't we? Because in that particular period, what did we see emerge? We saw slippages. Capitalism was too boastful. And it raised doubts in our society. And, and I suppose we can understand why. Here again, without wishing to get involved in too much statistics and facts and figures, I think everybody feels in their guts what I'm saying, I think. Um, over the last few years, quite clearly, We've seen uh, changes, particularly in respect of inequality. And this throws up uh, endless debate. But it's true. I mean, we can see that this m globalization hasn't been of benefit to everybody. And this is a feeling which I think meets with a certain consensus. You know, if I were to tell you that some serious studies have borne out that over the last 30 years or so, 1% of, of the uh, richest have uh, captured 30% of wealth generated in the world. I mean, you can argue about the figures, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's that order of magnitude, isn't it? Now, if you say, if you listen to OEC, OECD, who says that today in Europe, for example, they're not far from 12 or 15% of the population that are are not in education, NIT for short. They're not in training, NIT. You know, that uh, shows that there's a correlation between the fact that young, that youth unemployment in, in Europe is high, about 17% of the population. It's worse in France because it stands at 19%. Sometimes this inequality can strike us as a, as a bit of a caricature and perhaps stop on this point. But, you know, in the United States, uh, the 50 most wealthy uh, and you, when you've got the 66 million poor those are the figures but what's sitting behind this I suppose the fact that we're a bit sh we find it a bit shocking but over and beyond the matter of, of inequality I think there's also an increasing perception that capitalism is also responsible for a certain amount of damage wreaking havoc uh, environmentally and its developments, its uh, unchecked uh, uh, development has set out of kilter the climate, wrought havoc with biodiversity. There are lots of debates revolving around that. Naturally, industry is totally irresponsible, according to some critics. Well, of course, it's not always wrong, is it? Let's be honest. Um, creation of energy and, and farming, all these economic matters are challenged. At the end of the day, capitalism also should step up to the mark. But there's also more deep-seated uh, issues here. There's a, a breaking down in our society. It's something that we need to take into account. Um, I don't want to dwell on this, but there is the feeling that, on the one hand, there's the feeling that they're the elites that have prospered somewhere or another. On the other side, the vast segments of, the, of society more broadly that haven't benefited from that period of time, and that therefore a feeling of imbalance, an imbalance between the sharing, the distribution of wealth, you've got the sh between, let's say, the shareholders, it's loosely, loosely worded, and the rest of the world, uh, employees, for example, of companies. So basically an underlying feeling that, that there's a lack of community in humankind's destiny. Bien sûr, il y a de multiples autres causes, mais quand on a vu le mouvement des indignés uh, en Espagne, quand on a vu le mouvement when you see uh, Wall Street in the United States and the yellow vests in France, then uh, you know, examples abound.
all these various radical movements find or are rooted in the perceptions that I've just laid out before you. And I think just to pick up on your question, I think that's where the genuine matter lies. And in the short period of 30 years that I could compare with a long period, I mentioned it long, but this in the short phase of 30 years, things have been intense. And the reason why we're having this debate today is quite clearly because it has been so intense over the last 30 years that we need to find a solution. And I think that's, that's an answer to your question. So we have uh, various issues related to the economic crisis and to this notion of reality of the middle classes that you had brought up. But prior to that, I'd like to ask you whether there's not an original uh, misunderstanding. Tocqueville said that there are two ways of being a Democrat. First of all, based on one's own self-interest. What does democracy bring me? It brings me what I want. And then the second mode is to be really attached to the intrinsic values of democracy. So my question is, have populations not turned away from democracy once uh, capitalism uh, um, brought unbridled uh, growth? And so the model country today uh, is China. China is not a democratic country. And it is also a capitalistic country. Yes, you're bringing up a, a, a point that's really making it uh, complex when you talk about capitalism and de democracy. These two concepts um, don't always uh, exist well together. You mentioned China. That's a typical example. That's a state capitalism, which uh, actually came into being in the 1930s. Uh, uh, the hardcore capitalism it began with uh, Milton Friedman's uh, theses. And at the time, um, the Chinese leaders uh, grabbed that type of uh, capitalism that North America uh, was presenting to them. Remember all those uh, major debates. And quite cleverly, uh, they absorbed capitalism in its most aggressive form. And in fact, um, it, it melted into Chinese culture. And, and China, of course, is a complex country. Um, the, the, the number one article of the Constitution of uh, the People's Republic of China says that it's a socialist state um, under a popular uh, democratic dictatorship. Uh, that's the article of, first article of their Constitution. So um, democracy and cap capitalism are not really related in that particular uh, type of context. So democracy and capitalism don't always match up. And this is at a point when capitalism didn't exist. And in some communities, uh, democracy was founded. And um, apart for, uh, with the exception of Athens, um, um, which is not really democracy because slaves and women couldn't vote um, in uh, the antiquity, uh, Athens of the antiquity. And then um, we did have the creation of the foundations of uh, democracy, which uh, was then um, underpinned in Italian cities. And if we look at this more closely, well, the roots can be found um, in another area. Regarding the point you made um, about the fact that part of the population feels left on the wayside, and this is expressed by the various radical uh, movements, but also by a lack of interest in institutions, this notion that the elites are no longer uh, answering the calls. Uh, and are adding, uh, acting like ventriloquists. And so you don't feel concerned or involved. And this is uh, certainly demonstrated by the lack of voting uh, during democratic elections, notably in France. And that's quite unfortunate. And this uh, is something that contributes to the current situation. So let's go back to that issue of them and us, us and them. So the, the distinction that's made sometimes between the people and the elite. I'd like to mention something that Christopher Lash said. He mentioned uh, that the elites were giving up. And then there Warren Buffett's uh, joke saying that the, the struggle of the classes has taken place. And the elite won uh, that. And um, this notion 
goes through um, French population as well as other Western populations. So how can we respond to this uh, feeling of having been um, left by the wayside? Another sentence comes to mind, something by uh, Camus who says that nations die because the elites melt. And so that's another way of seeing things. Uh, it, it's very concerning, and um, I think it's important for us to respond and to react. And this type of conversation that we're having to do, that we're doing today, is exactly for that. Warren Buffett's sen uh, was an American sense of humor. I don't know about the struggle of classes. Um, you know. This is a, a type of uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, capitalism in its strongest expression. And it's quite dangerous because it creates confrontations. And uh, that's the last thing we need uh, today. So if you feel like you're part of the elite, which is, also qu which is already quite pretentious, well, there are certain duties that fall upon us whereby we need to maybe set things right. So if I may take the opposite stand to yours, I would say that today the so-called elite, be it economical or political elite, needs to uh, prove that it uh, is humble. And it also needs to be uh, very effective in what it does and it must provide uh, tangible actions that are credible. And that's not just uh, hand-wringing and, and words that are lined up. Uh, and the elite needs to... Uh, be exemplary uh, for trust to exist. There needs to be uh, ownership, uh, accountability. Uh, these are words, but they're very difficult to put into action. And so if we want to kill this notion that the elite is really drifting away from the rest of the world, we need to react very quickly. And I believe it is possible. And, and that's what's positive about our uh, conversation. We've brought up various reasons for not longer living in democracy due to the excesses of capitalism. But may I remind you of the economic crisis uh, 2008, and uh, as CEOs of companies, many of us experienced it, and it was really the, the, the final outcome of um, the excesses of a certain form of financial capitalism, which led to an extremely significant down economic downturn. And this is an example of what we haven't quite left out. Exemplarity, if we use concrete examples, could it be in terms of the, the compensation, the level of compensation to uh, company owners, which might be limited? Or perhaps it could be uh, greater demands in terms of the of results uh, and higher penalties. What would that look like? Well, I think that's a little bit limiting to say that. I, I think we need to talk about the capability of um, CEOs to bring about a new form of capitalism. Of course, uh, the level of compensation is a delicate issue. It's a sensitive issue because it's uh, something that conveys a, a message, a strong message. And there have been uh, abusive uh, levels of compensation, uh, but we can't simply invent uh, a certain form of equalitarianism just for the sake of uh, inventing equalitarianism. But in addition, I think it's very important to, to act, um, and that's what I would like to exhort all of you to do, to encourage you all to do. I think it's important to, to, to really help the concept of capitalism evolve. Quite often, I like, I, I like to refer to responsible capitalism, for lack of a better word, responsible capitalism. But I believe it's in that direction that we really need to move. Uh, some time ago, um, over three years ago, I had the great privilege of uh, compiling a report with uh, Nicole Mota, who's a former uh, trade union leader, um, and we wrote on a, a report on the role of enterprise. At the time, uh, I was fascinated by the discussion that was beginning to emerge regarding what is capitalism, what is the purpose of enterprise, and what is it, what role should enterprise play? And we reached very striking conclusions. And today, I'm very pleased to see that these uh, observations are now being deployed in France and even worldwide. The conclusions that we came to is that capitalism must evolve, must change. And of course, it has changed in the past. Uh, 
the, mer the merchant capitalism of the 15th to 17th centuries. Then we have the industrial capitalism. We have financial capitalism at the end of the 20th century. Uh, capitalism is a bit of a chameleon. It changes shapes and forms and colors, and it's changed in the past, so why not uh, change again? So today, uh, we really need to uh, find the right balance. We need to create a capitalism that is reassuring, that brings people together, and that is a capitalism which the underlying principle whereby we say, yes, economy is important, enterprise is here, enterprises need to generate revenue. Uh, it's something that we need to be able to say quite clearly because this is necessary for everybody's survival. So yes, enterprises need to generate revenue, but they need to do more than just uh, generate revenue. Today's enterprises, corporations, above and beyond their economic performance, must also take into account other considerations regarding the, their social and environmental impact. And that was the basis of the report that we compiled. And Bruno Le Maire um, thus integrated several components um, um, and even modified part of the French Civil Code. I mean, at the time, there were many heated discussions. But this certainly confirms a, a postulate whereby we can say that uh, a new form of responsible capitalism must emerge. And this is a capitalism that uh, needs to look towards the future. It must uh, be a sustainable form of uh, capitalism. I called it the capitalism of the raison d'être, a very lovely uh, French word that is, not, that is seldom used, but means a lot, uh, the reason to be, the raison d'être. Which leads us to ask, what is my origins? What is my North Star? What characterizes corporations? And how can we ensure that the employees of uh, different enterprises understand their goals? Why do they come to work every day? Where, what is the meaning, uh, the quest for meaning that is ex extremely important? Once we can give meaning to our activities, then there will be less uh, radicalism. And so the role of the so-called elite, uh, the heads of corporations, of company uh, CEOs, is to give meaning to things, and, and particularly to give meaning to economic matters. And this goes back to the exemplar exemplarity that I was mentioning uh, earlier. We need to have a common destiny. And if we believe that capitalism must be a system that delivers prosperity to all, all the while resolving environmental and social issues, then we won't just have buzzwords. We will have fundamental words. And it really will change things. And in fact, um, I remember that when this um, report was published, it was uh, not warmly received, to be quite frankly. And I was actually uh, somewhat um, disappointed by the negative reaction with which it was received, notably from the business world. Today, three years later, I feel a great sense of relief uh, because this notion of the raison d'etre, the notion of uh, giving meaning and considering that um, th th this principle, the, 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 uh, the, the main principle that underpins everything, the company's strategy, uh, the company's life cycle, is now finally being deployed. And so that's what I wanted to reiterate. Uh, the solution, we have it, but how do we implement it? Uh, we need to use resolve, and perhaps France uh, could perhaps be a guiding light, a benchmark in Europe for this. But we also need to reassure ourselves, because if we look to the, towards the United States, since uh, this is a forum in which we're talking a lot about the relation between North America and Europe, in the United States, in fact, this is a concept that has taken form and that is being deployed. And that is very reassuring, even though I think it is being deployed differently in the United States than in Europe with concepts that are not the same. We can touch upon that later if you wish to do so. But there is a, a, an underlying movement uh, that is starting to take shape and that is starting to emerge. Uh, and if that final step uh, is able to take place in the next five or 10 years, well, then I think we can rest uh, assured on the future of capitalism and democracy. So this fundamental shift that you refer to is something that is noticeable in daily life and in uh, the world of enterprise. But there are two pitfalls that are also visible. Uh, 
And the first pitfall, pitfall is a form of cynicism. You know, companies often uh, tout uh, their positive actions, whereas in reality uh, they are doing quite the opposite in their commercial practices. Second pitfall is ideology. So in the name of notions that we all share, be it uh, about in equality or inclusion, sometimes um, this can also crowd in other principles uh, that are of a more political nature. And this brings us back to the notion of democracy. And so notably coming from the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, who, uh, well, they often contradict um, the universalism of the French model uh, based on the principle of uh, diversity. So how do you assess that? And do you share that point of view? And how do you think we can avoid the pitfalls that I just mentioned? Well, the first pitfall that you mentioned is real. It exists. But the good news is that in today's world, I believe it's going to disappear quite rapidly. What's good about a uh, social network and the digital era is that uh, it's impossible to lie in today's world. If you claim a raison d'etre, a reason of being, uh, that often requires at least two years of work in a company. It doesn't just uh, happen overnight, uh, born out of the brain of a CEO. If you claim uh, raison d'etre, which should really be the top um, uh, of a corporate strategy, but then if you do not implement it in the day in, day out workings of your company, particularly in terms of managerial practices, well, believe me, uh, this uh, claim won't last for long because as we all know, uh, young generations and even less young generations uh, know how to use uh, social media and you can claim whatever you want as a CEO, but if you do the opposite, um, people will know that immediately. And in real time, um, many, uh, you'll see that your own employees are um, commenting on what you're doing. So whatever your claim you're making, if it's not sustainable, then it's not gonna last for very long. So this obligates people, to, uh, company leaders, to, to keep their promises. Now, in terms of uh, various movements, some were mentioned uh, yesterday. For example, um, vocism. This is something that is starting to appear in France. So um, the wokeism, wokeism is something that certainly exists in the United States, but it's starting to appear even in American corporations. Uh, yes, and as I mentioned, uh, wokeism is even starting to appear in, in, in Europe. Uh, and so if uh, raison d'etre is well developed, well shared, and it's important to, sh to, to, to share it, to communicate it to others, I'm often astounded, um, and let me give you the example of the Renault uh, Corp uh, Group. So we published our raison d'etre in April after 18 months of work. And the discussions that I have in plants and companies uh, at, at head offices about this particular topic are endless. There's a thirst uh, for talking about this. Uh, it, it's quite astounding to see how much people need to talk because that was something that was lacking in the past, conversation, dialogue. And so I believe if this is uh, well done, it will thus naturally uh, be deployed and then you can avoid the ty certain types of excesses. But if it's not uh, sturdy, then it will um, bring about uh, excesses. So in terms of wokeism, uh, you know, as the president of Renault, it's, uh, I would have to say that it was unimaginable for us to allow the discrimination of people based on their identity, be it uh, gender or sexual or uh, ethnic uh, related. It's just out of the question. And here we need to be extremely rigorous because if we're not rigorous, then you're just opening uh, the way for excesses. On the other hand, if wokeism is a principle based on which uh, people's value should be enhanced uh, on the sole basis of their identity, but that, that will not work. Donc, quelle que soit leur identité, qui doit être totalement respectée. And people, regardless of their identity, need to be respected. So people must go on being 
valorized according to their merit, to their involvement and implication. Full stop. Now, from there, I believe that this type of movement that you were talking about will find its natural limits because, once again, if the elites, to take a general term, are doing the duties, we won't have any reason for any problem. It's a little bit optimistic, of course, but within the symbolic elements that are altering a little bit the perspective of the opinion on capitalism, there is a fascinating, vertiginous movement of GAFA, in other words, the Silicon Valley companies that are not, not liberal but feudal. In other words, they have so much power that they behave as uh, despots and not like Democrats. And they have uh, prerogatives of uh, nation states. They're sending people in, the f in space, and they consider that they're equivalent of more ancient political powers. In this articulation between capitalism and democracy, how should you do with these powers altogether on the financial level, but also on uh, the possibility of incredible diffusion of software? Should we regulate them? Should we contain them? And should we do with them as such as an, with a new entity that would be no, not economical or not political? All right, there are several points of your question. The entities today who have uh, cross-cutting actions have been in existence for a long time. I'm not talking about international law. There are sometimes contested, but NGOs, for instance, that the company have to deal with, positively and negatively, they're already widely global. So we live with it, so to speak. It's something that we can manage. In the GAFA particular case, there is a topic that appears to me utterly extravagant is that these entities have claim rights that are, in fact, extraordinary. In other words, the complete feeling of irresponsibility, unliability versus the contents. After all, there is a form of consensus on it. Things developed in such a way that this uh, ref uh, refusal of responsibility of liability is like a fact now. Uh, we, uh, we fought it in the media, but without any success. Yeah, but it generated a lot of uh, derivation and blunders. And very recently, we saw that the networks are capable of forbidding uh, an account from a uh, chief of state and not close counts of organizations that sometimes are obviously terrorists. Who is judging? In a democracy, normally, it's the law. Here, we have totally out of it, which is a little complicated. So something has to change on that. It would be good for us, for them, perhaps, to avoid following in what's happening in China. We were mentioning earlier democracy and capitalism do not uh, love each other. So we saw the brutal reaction of Chinese power today, who sees in the uh, development of GAFA, Chinese GAFA a risk against their own authority as a nation. I'm not the head of GAFA, and I cannot put myself in front of the shoes. But if I were them, I would pay attention, because what is coming up Perhaps it's a popular reaction against them. And I think then the scope is wide. And we should be prepared for a future that is uh, correct. You said that in France, finally, after a cold uh, reception, the uh, enterprises were installed for three years. It's a phenomenon that is disseminating elsewhere. Is there any European project on the European scale that is a little bit articulated, a little bit ambitious, and thought in depth in between the various European companies, or is it still, it's, it's being born, pushed by this movement that I was mentioning, pushed by populations, and not only by younger generation, saying now we have to go a step further and make sense in what we're doing. As far as Europe is concerned, as far as I'm concerned, 
is fundamental. In other words, it's a cultural topic. All the principles that I vaguely mentioned earlier that I, yeah, have their roots in Europe. When we had the Rome Treaty, it was laid on these principles of responsible capitalism. It was thinking about social economy of market. It was it, though. I don't want, by the way, to go back there to avoid polemics on the Christian roots of Europe, but uh, in, in fact, it's very similar, and they link to each other. I have to say it frankly, because I think it's true. Now, the cultural glue that links the uh, Europe is there, so we're not talking intensively on the European sovereignty on all plans, or the military, protection of borders, economical. It seems to me that this particular link is the one that would be the strongest cement because it's cultural. And develop the principle of responsible capitalism, as I mentioned it, on a European scale is the surest way of ensuring unity, whether it's on a long-term basis and political, because it's deeply solid. And this capitalism is, in fact, a very clear alternative between the Anglo-Saxon Freemanian capitalism and the Chinese capitalism. If we want to trace a path in Europe that would be credible and that it would allow to assert an entity for Europe, we must accelerate the implementation of this responsible capitalism. What is interesting is that the United States could not avoid. I see this movement. I often receive letters of major CEOs of funds in uh, uh, America who explain to me what I should do. I'm very pleased to receive those letters. Well, I have my own little idea, of course, but uh, you see this movement that is coming up. And what is quite interesting, it's not totally of the same nature. In other words, the, this responsible capitalism that we are hearing about to be developed in Northern America is similar with what I talked about for European, but differences of values. And I, I have to think that Europe on this level is, has a specific characteristic. The Renan capitalism that I lived personally when I was working in Germany, French in Germany, has nothing to do with the responsible capitalism such as the American funds are trying to develop today. There is an obvious dimension missing, which is solidarity, and a social dimension as well. If we want to get into the detail, the role of the delegate representative of uh, personnel, the so social solidarity we see developing in Europe has nothing to do with what's happening in the United States. It's all right. It's complementary. It's additional. But what I want to say here, because it's really a place where I can talk about it, is that this capitalism I'm talking about, you have to co-build it. And the worst that could happen is that Europe, in a certain way, finds itself dominated by a flux coming from the U.S., carrying those values. I'm nothing against it, mind you, but they're not sufficient to reflect the European identity. And if we don't co-build it together, we are going to create gaps, confrontation in between two worlds. I just want to get together. Let, I hope I'm clear. It's very important. Facing to this changes that I think is positive globally, that the characteristics of the continents are reflected in their values. This is how I would answer your question. Very clear. I would ask you a last question because we have going to conclude. As far as the ecological green dimension, which is a specificity that Europe is pushing forward, and on the difficulty in front of which we're probably going to find ourselves and yourself as a CEO of Renault, in the transformation of, com of societies, our day-to-day -day lives, quality of life, the thermic car to electric car around 2030, and the social cost that this type of mutation can generate. Uh, 
is that the raise on gesture and the purpose wouldn't be too costly for those populations that we were mentioning earlier, and that feel already that are forgotten. You're talking about topics that are very concrete, because this, what we're telling each other must uh, land. The question of energy transition is not an issue. Today, it's obvious that we must absolutely implement, and I will not elaborate too much on this, but the way of uh, proceeding is important. And there, uh, indeed, we are touching directly the, the social impacts of the activity of a company. And there, on the general matter, the only way of getting out of this situation that is complex, mind you, because for the life of the company, the alliance of Mitsubishi and Renault, can you imagine what a revolution that was? Massive investments, conversions of employment, training of tens of thousands of people, a very restricted time to permit employability in the future is something that we don't even um, comprehend of the amplitude of the topic. But there is a risk. Let's rest assured we're just talking about it when it, it needs to be done. It's indeed to provoke this revolution at such a rhythm that you end up by putting in danger a few social situations. To tell you the truth, since we're in the pragmatic world, the way that we all collectively got out of the diesel world to switch to other things are really, without creating too much impact, was, as far as I'm concerned, the model that w should not be done. And since we're being concrete, I can tell you that I'm still with my team trying to manage issues, social issues on uh, companies that were in the automotive sector, and those questions should have never arrived if we did anticipate the problem correctly. And we're not out of it. <clears throat> so if we go too fast in suppressing thermic motor, particularly hybrid motor that is a formula for transition, we are going to have major social problem because we've got talking tens of thousands of employment in the sector that are qualitatively in, in, involved in today's motorization. So this is the issue, and we're in the full uh, idea of empowering, responsibility, liability, and so forth. We should not reproduce what we had done. The political and economical spirits are in, educated enough today to avoid drama. So let's hope that reason would prevail well, thank you very much to finish on this optimistic uh, word. Thank you so much, sir. Now, if you have questions, we have time for one or two questions. I will, should I give you my mic? Thank you. I have the honor to take the mic the first. So I'm Jim Gillet. I'm retired from Bercy and specialist of energy, civil servant. I believe that two teams or two poles, capitalism and democracy, and capitalism was the pole of the company, democracy the pole of the states. And I had the feeling that this unbalance that we have right now is because there's too much freedom of economy and not enough state. In the relationship between the enterprises and the state, there is an unbalance. So let me explain, or the freedom of uh, consume, liberty of enterprise, is not the liberty of destroy nature. So we need to canalize and channel the economic uh, dynamism, whether so the, the footballer wins 100 million or a CEO, that's not the issue. If they don't uh, re report fiscally uh, properly, I see Bitcoin, for instance, that is coming up. It's an extension. 
uh, freedom to have enterprise, the freedom of finance, to the detriment of say. So capitalism and democracy is a relationship, is a strength relationship between uh, power, economical power that should be channeled by public powers. I'm going to try and answer the question that uh, is a sensitive point in such a way. If you pursue the pathway that I was talking towards, uh, responsible credit, it means that the enterprise is a political institution because at one point, if we debate on who's doing what and what is separation between the rural state and the companies, we're going to get lost because the world is changing so fast. And I told you, the enterprise and the political enterprise in the noble sense of the term. Why? Because we're the heart of the city. Nothing could be done without companies and enterprises. When I say they have a political role, it means they have a role on all the stakeholders. And the stakeholders is a very large notion. Of course, it's the shareholders and the employees which are structuring, but it also the rest, i.e. the ecosystem of the company, the states, clients, suppliers, press, media, NGOs. You can quote them all. A company today is not living on its own and is not expecting from the state necessarily specific injunction to live, but it lives with it. And everybody has its role to play. We cannot imagine in the future entities that would not participate to the same purpose that could be qualified of common wealth or general interest. And states and company are together are constrained. It's a wish to walk side by side in intelligent partnership that would lead to the general interest. The best way I have to answer your question, and let's not lost in vain debates about should the company dominate the state or they dominate the enterprise, if this is a dead end. In fact, they have to work together in a collective intelligence. And to tell you the truth, if you look at the situation of the world today, this is what we're seeing in a lot of states. Check what's happening in China, in the US, whether you want it or not, there's osmosis between the company and political power. Don't say me otherwise. Tell me otherwise. In Germany, you see it quite clearly too, and it's happening properly. I have many further examples. In France, we're always navigating between two orders, with an embrace creed that should be clarified. The implementation of responsible competition is of a nature to clarify this, and I hope I'm clear. And it's very important not to drown in the debate. But should the state be? the dominant power in the system or not. No, we won't get nowhere to dead end once again. This is how I feel. A question from Mr. Pavel Fischer. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question uh, that will project you onto the civism aspect or citizenship aspect. Because freedom, yeah. capitalism is possible in free societies, it's an emanation of freedom, of enterprise, of getting, of committing. And my question is about citizenship, because we're around Alexis de Tocqueville, who at one point complained that our time is not taking care about the education to citizenship enough, because uh, Societies are not only NGOs, it's not the state only, it's not exclusively enterprises, it's above all citizens. And I would like to know which are these qualities of citizen, of civism. How would you characterize you, yourself as a citizen? What are the necessary quality to be able to talk about a human being in terms of being a citizen, what are those qualities? Oh, it's not an easy question that you're asking here. I think that the answer is quite natural. H human being 
just wants to be a citizen. That's his first query. I'm not quoting Rousseau here, but uh, almost. But this is his first desire. Sometimes it's an, he is in an environment that doesn't allow it. I will not talk to you about dictatorship, that women, where capitalism can exist perfectly, all right. This is a, very specific, but if you want to go back to our Western society, U.S., Northern Europe, and so forth, I think that the citizen just w wishes that. And when he finds a purpose to his life, when he's explained what is the purpose of uh, his work, of his existence uh, at work, he hears it. And he adheres to it. He accepts it. But he's got to be explained. And he's got to be explained that's what he's doing somewhere, as we say today, is in relationship with common wealth. Whatever the enterprises you're working in, whether it's food, industrial, automotive, whatever, at one point, you have to demonstrate or not that you're working for common wealth of everybody and general interest. Differently from Milton Friedman, who is saying that enterprise was only there for profit, as long as it paid taxes, the general interest was other people's business as the state. Contrary to that, I would say that we can today consider that an individual who is within a company, because he understands his raison d'etre, is working for commonwealth, and therefore he's a citizen. The rest is a personal attitude. But this is the answer for me. This is why this responsible competition is so important. It transforms the deal of citizenship. Stop asking whether you have to be a citizen or not when you don't know what you do. When you work in a company and you understand what you do, you have this natural dimension. I hope I answer your question. Merci beaucoup. Thanks very much. I think there's our last question. Last question? Thanks very much. Meaningfulness. I wanted to ask you about that. Some people uh, has a function to create meaning. Scientists, academics. But meaningfulness for you, it's production. It's, it seems as though you're saying that that's reserved to uh, a relationship between CEOs and their employees, which corresponds to the French world, this where the academic world doesn't want to intervene in corporate life. And corporate life doesn't uh, open up to the university world and science more broadly. Do you think these things are changing there? Yes, rest assured. I mean, in, in my mind, at least, I wasn't intending to exclude. Yes, but in your mind, but of course, there is a difference in your mind and the reality in France. Um, well, yes, but yeah, I can see not only a desire to uh, fill the gap between the academic world and the corporations. When I was uh, CEO of Michelin, I devoted a lot of time to make sure that universities, regional universities, were very much involved in the group's research there were openings, and it wasn't very easy. I, I, I acknowledge that. It was done uh, in such a way that people discovered what other people did across the divide, if you will. Now, in France, you need greater efforts because you can see this happening elsewhere in the USA, for example. But things are moving, and it's crucial that it does so. And it's so uh, important and necessary that one of the problems... Uh, for understanding citizenry in France, I'm sorry to be Franco-French here, it's um, precisely because there is this sort of wall um, between uh, the sets of people you're talking about. And I'm struck, really, hugely struck, by the lack of common understanding that exists on the point that you raise. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. The French political world, and it's not its it's not its fault. I mean, Lord knows their role is important, and it's a thankless task. I mean, I'm I'd be the first uh, 
to kind of create that link between political life and economic life by encouraging uh, the economic uh, life to hitch up with the political life. But there is a wall, a great divide. This is, uh, you know, things are opening up. And it's amazing that uh, high-ranking political figures discover the corporate world uh, only when they turn up on on the corporate corporation's premises. Now, we're amongst ourselves, and, and this has nothing to do with today's debate, but I think one thing that's crucial, and I suppose this answers your question, in the electoral campaign that's opening as we speak, there's a, a strong proposal which says that <coughs> uh, school teachers, before uh, they uh, take up their position as teachers, they should spend six months in companies. And if they were to do that, I think that would meet your concern. Thank you very much. So I'll jot down that proposal and perhaps we can reintroduce it into a, a, a later debate. Thanks very much.